Definitely when I went to Salathe, I watched Fred Badula's El Capitan, which I just thought was amazing. I mean, the sound design in that was brilliant. Yeah, I, lo- I loved all the bits where they're eating sardines using their pitons for forks. Yeah, that was that was a big influence on me, I think. Out of all, out of all the climbing films that I've seen, that was the most influential because I really needed it then. Okay, so this story is a complete saga. But at its heart, it's quite simple. And it reminded me of something that Tom Livingston told me a few months ago. That once you put a story out in the world, you kind of lose ownership of it and the effects that it has. For this one, I want to go back first to the spring of 1968. You're a filmmaker from San Francisco, Fred Perdula, and you drive into the Yosemite Valley. You park up and wander through the redwoods to the meadow and gaze up at El Cap. And you're faced with this impossible task. Because one of your students, Glenn Denny, is an avid climber and photographer. He wants to make a film as awe-inspiring as Climbing the Nose. And he's asked you to help. You're listening to Factor 2 from UK Climbing. I should explain to you, I'm not a climber. I really didn't know anything about climbing. I had really no interest in climbing. And Glenn, Denny, introduced me to climbing during all these conversations we had. And it was a it was a sport at that time that I would not have had the nerve to even get involved with. Um, but the idea of making such a film was was intriguing. Fred didn't know it that morning when he drove into the valley, but he'd still be working on this film in 10 years' time. He was worried about whether they'd be able to film on the wall and record sound, whether they could fund the whole project. And he didn't know that the whole thing would fall apart. And the reason why lies somewhere between Fred and Glenn's artistic vision and a little film called The Endless Summer. What every surfer dreams of finding is a small wave with perfect shape, what we call a perfect wave. The odds against finding that are 10 million to one. They finally got their first look at Cape St. Francis, South Africa. Bruce Brown's film had made him a millionaire of a fairly modest budget. He was friends with the North Face founder, Doug Tompkins, who was still in his early 20s. Doug had recently sold his North Face shops in San Francisco. He had a bit of money around, and he wanted to invest in a film that was going to do the same for climbing as Brown's film had done for surfing. Glenn Denny knew Doug, and he saw an opportunity, so he arranged a meeting. He later said that he should have known that he and Doug were on a different wavelength when Doug had shown up in his Ferrari. But Doug threw in a big chunk of money. Along with Fred, Glenn and Cato Avenali, they had a decent budget of $30,000 to make this film nearly a quarter of a million in today's prices. Glenn sorted a helicopter and sourced tens of thousands of feet of film while Fred was troubleshooting the sound. All they needed now was a team capable of climbing the nose. So here we are a month into the project. We still hadn't filmed anything yet. One climber couldn't wait around any longer, so Doug Tompkins, who at that time had raised some money for us, uh, came up with another climber, and he didn't get along with the first two climbers. Fred is perhaps showing his detachment from the climbing world here. The climbers that were being rejected were the likes of Royal Robbins, Yvonne Chouinard, Jose Louis Von Rouge, and Chuck Pratt. And so then we came up with Lido, Tiana Flores, who who just put a whole lot of life into the film and the and the overall attitude and inspiration, because he's just a, at that time was just full of energy and enthusiasm. And so almost a month after we planned, we started filming. We were going to start filming on the first part of May. And I think we did our first filming in June. And so Glenn uh, and the climbers started filming. And what they did was they filmed for a couple of days. And then they came back down. And we decided what we'd do is we just filmed from the bottom. As we went up, as we progressed up, we'd go up for a couple of days, fix, pitch, uh, fix, fix uh, ropes so they could just do more down. Along with Leto would be Gary Culliver and Richard McCracken 
both of whom had been part of the fourth ascent of the nose. Well, you know, I was more or less living in Yosemite Valley uh, along with a a few other climbers. In those days, not everybody, it wasn't very popular except on weekends. So sometimes me and a couple other climbers have the valley to ourselves. But anyway, El Capitan had been climbed uh, the nose route three times. And I did the fourth ascent with Gary Culliver, who's in the film, and with another fellow named John Evans. You know, we've been climbing around the valley, and so it was going to be a great adventure. It took us uh, three and a half days, which was uh, the case with the third ascent. Ascents after that took that same amount of time. So it was quite a while before it was climbed faster than that. When we did the film, which was in 1968 when we filmed it, I think it had been climbed in two days at that point. It was a very big deal. It was the biggest climb in the valley for sure. Uh, Hardly anybody climbed it in the early to the mid-60s. But like all things in climbing, the the more people that climb it, the more popular it becomes, the less, the more people are willing to give it a go. But um, it was a big deal to climb it. It goes a long ways. And uh, like starting out on a climb, it seems ridiculous to say this now, but it used to feel like you were starting out on a long journey, you know. Um, When we did the fourth ascent, we had uh, two army duffel bags full of gear. We didn't have down, uh, down bags, but we had down jackets in them and what we called foot sacks. They're very thin. They're not down or anything like that. Um, and then, of course, lots of water. We kind of skimped on water because it was so heavy, although it was very hot in Yosemite Valley, especially on El Capitan, which faces south. So from the, from the sunrise to the sunset, if you're on that wall in the middle of the summer when we were filming, it can get very hot. I guess maybe up to 100. I, I don't know. I never actually checked the thermometer. The climbing there is different because the walls are very steep and they're also for rock pretty smooth i mean you can get well abraded on granite for sure but um unless you hit a ledge you could fall quite a ways down and and not get seriously hurt you could tell how good a piton is by how well it rang if it, if it just sang out, you knew that you had a good solid grip on the rock with the piton, so you knew you could fall on it with the assurance that it wasn't going to pull out. Uh, at the other end of the scale, you, you'd pound the piton in, and it would go clunk, 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 and that was about it, and that was really dodgy. So um, you generally could not depend on those at all as protection for a fall. Yeah, then back, as far as pitons go, um, they varied in size to something called the RURP, which is an acronym for the Realized Ultimate Reality Piton, which was invented and produced by Yvonne Chouinard in his foundry. It, it was about the size of a large postage stamp and about an eighth of a, an inch thick on one edge, and then it tapered to a blunt point on the other. This was used just for direct aid, of course of which I did a lot, actually. And that did, definitely didn't ring when you pounded it in. You just pounded it in. It might go in an eighth of an inch, a quarter inch. Hard to know in a bottoming crack, of which there were plenty in Yosemite. Then you would clip your sling into it and gingerly stand on it and pray that it held. And if it did, if it did hold, you'd get high on your slings and then put another piton in. And then the sizes went on up from there to uh, very thin pitons, about the thinness of a table knife, then then to quarter inch and half inch and so on. It's roughly decided, uh, described the size crack they would go in. If they got above uh, up to a half inch and above three quarters, then they were tapered to a a blunt point, so they just fit a variety of cracks in them. Those are called angle pitons, and they go one all the way up to six inches. 
The six-inch pitons, which were called bongs, were made of aluminum, actually, rather than steel. And the bongs rang like uh, the bells of a cathedral or something. And I've often likened um, the sound of pitons to gamelan orchestras, for instance. We have a variety of tones. We use swami belts uh, for protection around our waist. And, you know, we take a, that's a one inch tubular webbing. And we take a 10 or 12 or 15 foot length of it and make, take several wraps around our waist and then tie a knot. And then either tie the rope in that or clip the rope in with a piton into the, the swami belt. Stop. Stop. Okay. Shit, somehow I came untied. Climb on the dark, untied. <laughs> You, you still have the end? Huh. Hang on, Gary. So we didn't have anything like the climbing harnesses they have now. So it pretty much really hurt when you fell any distance to hit the end of a rope. And uh, there are, you know, belay techniques that can alleviate that. A good belayer will, with a rope, we also, you only belay by putting a rope around your waist. You didn't go through any devices or any of the, ATCs or any of that stuff they use now. and But a good belayer could let the, the rope kind of slide as somebody hit the end of the rope and, uh, you know, alleviate some of the jar. Oh. 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 Wait. Move in, okay? I'll let you down. No! Oh, God damn oh. you! All right. Fuck! You, you, hey, pull! Pull! Oh. What'd you okay. say? That was a... I thought I'd drop the No, equipment. I was good. Jesus oh, Christ, I thought you came yeah. down so far. Did you pull a bolt out? Yeah. You're going above the roof? We created a giant antenna on the valley floor, and we just kept fooling around with it, uh, made better antennas on the, on the microphones. Uh, are you all right, Gary? More or less. Did you hit yeah. your elbows or anything? No, I landed sideways. Ah, you jerked your side around. Yeah. Yeah, right. Boy, that was really a... I'm glad they're quick. <laughs> yeah, right. You wouldn't, want, you wouldn't want to do that too long, would you? No. And then decide how are we going to record this. So we decided to give Glenn a microphone and then the three climbers each a microphone, or a total of four microphones. And Glenn's, uh, on the first day of shooting, uh, Glenn's mic quit working, and Lito hung his hardware on his mic cord and broke it immediately. So I just left two mics. Uh, which was uh, Gary and uh, uh, Gary Culliver and Richard McCracken. And um, Richard's mic worked fairly well. Gary's was had a lot of static in it. And so I went back to the technician who beefed up the power. I said, look, can we, uh, can we take every frequency starting from the lowest frequency and every time it goes up an octave, double the power. So by the time we were, you know, it was recording, it was recording on the height frequencies much louder than the lower frequencies. And then when we played it back, we were able to reduce the high frequencies down below what that radio hiss level was and got fairly good sound. Basically, what they did is they turned their mics on when they woke up and they turned them off when they went to sleep. And we just recorded everything. And we ended up with hundreds of hours of sound, which was the challenge of, of, uh, of uh, editing it. Three people was considered kind of an ideal team for climbing because if a multi-day climb, two could swing leads and the third person would do the hauling. You know, the leader would would lead the pitch, would have a hauling line hanging from him as well as a belay line. <clears throat> and then while, then he would anchor off the hauling line when he got to his anchor point. Okay, now McGregor, pull! Oh, I think we'll get up here in the long haul, don't you? <laughs> And then he would blade the second person up, and the hauling person would start jumaring, we call it jugging, up the rope with these uh, heavy bags hanging from him. So uh, filming it was, you know, of course, a lot different than just climbing it because we went up and down, and we'd film a, a low section. And then when uh, Fred, I mean, uh, Glenn decided he had enough of that, 
we'd hang a rope from the high point and then Jumar up and then continue from there. And there were big sections that we skipped. Glenn didn't consider them very interesting fo- photographically. And some were more interesting, like the uh, the big pendulum near the bottom we have, where you have to jump over the a three-foot wall to get over to Stove Lake Crack. We spent a lot of time there uh, filming that. And, of course, we had to climb those pitches more than once, sometimes several times, uh, setting Glenn up in different positions to film it. Like I've done that swing for us, which I, I did the pendulum on that because um, my legs were longest, I guess. Um, we, uh, Glenn, uh, filmed the first one from the bottom, and you know, I do several, several swings, some, sometimes not making it, sometimes making it to the stove leg crack. All right, let me down. Okay, slack. Right there, slack. Okay, another uh, two feet down. We we filmed over a period of about a oh, month or so, right okay. and we would film a couple of days. They would come down. We'd look at the footage we got, and then they'd go up and they'd climb another section. And uh, and the longest time they were ever up there were I think five days in a row, when. Um, when they uh, they were around El Cap Tower, I, I guess they were around the Boot Flake. They actually stayed up there around uh, four or five days, and then they came down, and that's when then we started filming from the top. Yeah, it's called the Gray Bands. Uh, the last the last thing we climbed was uh, the filming Leto doing the King Swing off of Boot Flake, which is the one with the helicopter shots, and he he's having trouble getting over there, and he kept he keeps floating. It's very easy, very hard to stay on the rock because it's so steep and you tend to want to float in the air. Once you make that and get everybody over there, then um, then you're in the gray bands. And it's about two pitches, which is about 300 feet, 350 feet. And that gets you up to camp four. So we didn't film that uh, Glenn considered that really uninteresting. And by then we were already 1,500 feet off the ground. That's a lot of jumaring. We had ropes all the way up to El Cap Towers, which is just below Boot Flake. And so we jumared up to there, spent several days there filming, uh, going up Boot Flake and the bolt ladder below it where um, a bolt pulled out and Gary had a fall, which is the sound is captured on the film, but... Glenn didn't get the video because he was changing film. Well, we were sh- we were shooting with the Airflex um, S, which is a beautifully designed film that uh, you know, the Germans designed in the before the Second World War. But uh, it's basically holds a hundred foot of film, a hundred reel foot reel, and that's two minutes and forty seconds of shooting time. So, as you can imagine, Glenn is changing film in the bright sun every two minutes and forty seconds. Except we didn't really get the last forty seconds because he's having to change the film in the bright sun on the wall. And usually, the beginning ten feet, the last ten feet of the of the roll got fogged. So much of the material, which uh, which might have been good footage was fogged just because uh, the camera had to be reloaded in such um, bright light. But it, it, if you can imagine today being only to shoot a little over two minutes and then have to stop what you're doing, take the ca- open up the camera, put that roll away, put another camera in, thread the film, the camera, which is kind of a tricky thing to do, um, considering that you've got dust and dirt and everything falling on top of you from the wall, that he was able to. Sh- to load that camera successfully and and have the patience to shoot for the for that such a brief period of time before you had to reload the camera again. Uh, I mean, I, I just think he did a, a, a superhuman job of just physically dealing with the, with the challenge, not to mention his artistic integrity. So I, I, you know, I really have a whole lot of respect for Glenn, and uh, and I I don't know that he even 
appreciates what he was able to bring off. Uh, but, uh, but it was pretty primitive in those days. So anyway, after we filmed that, we came down and brought all the ropes back down with us and then rappelled uh, close to 3,000 feet off the, I mean, you know, 1,500 feet, probably more like 1,300 feet, which is by far the most spectacular rappel I've ever done because you're 3,000 feet off the ground and it's overhanging for the first uh, one and a half rope lengths. Just amazing. <laughs> very, very awesome rappel. So they fixed pitch, they, they fixed ropes from the top down to about a thousand feet. And we worked from the top down. So we never really climbed the entire climb because there was about 500 feet that was never filmed, nor was it even climbed. And I should add that Lito later, who'd never climbed El Capitan, went back and climbed it because he was so frustrated that he hadn't really truly climbed the entire route. So he came back and very proud that he actually really did climb El Capitan, even though he had spent almost a month on the film, on the, uh, on the wall. We'd go down between the, the takes like that, and the film would be sent off to San Francisco. Someone acting as a runner would take it into the city and have it developed, and we'd spend, you know, two or three days in Camp 4, uh, and then we'd look at the film. The film would come back and be projected somewhere. I forget where we did that. We had a, access to a building in Yosemite Valley somewhere. And then uh, Glenn, uh, Glenn would decide whether he wanted to repeat anything. Yeah, it is. It's um, also Glenn is a a kind of a purist. He's he's. Uh, you can uh, have you seen his book? By this point, Doug was getting cold feet. He wanted to return on his investment. He had a second child on the way and an expedition to Patagonia coming up. He'd wanted to recreate the glamour of the endless summer, the girls in bikinis, the surf, and the travel. Watching three dirtbag climbers eat sardines with their pitons wasn't going to cut it for him. A clause in their contract meant that he could back out. Unbeknown to Fred, he did, and he took his money with him. Fred and Glenn had always been working on a different vision anyway. And they finished the filming. But something had changed for Glenn. And when Doug and Glenn had a falling out, Doug resigned from the whole project, and unbeknownst to us, he also withdrew all his money out of the account, leaving us with a deficit of his lacking his money, plus a lot of other bills we'd run up that we basically went over budget with. Glenn and I had gone back uh, a few months later and did some additional filming, some some sceneries, but then that was pretty much shortly after that. That's when Glenn did, resigned from the project, so. Uh, that's when I faced the reality of being responsible for what to do with the footage. And even though he had requested that the footage be destroyed, I felt that it was not the thing to do. So uh, that's kind of a very brief description of um, of how we got the filming done. You know, he was a very enigmatic person. Uh, he never, I, I just took him at his word. Uh, and that is that he didn't think a film could be made. I think he was intimidated by the deaths. And I, I, I don't think he had a clear idea of what he was going to do with the footage. And he felt that nobody else could make the film he had in mind or he hoped to make. And therefore, the film should never be made. And his request for me to destroy the footage was kind of, I think, a re- emotional response on his part. Um, but I just think he got very discouraged about the whole project and decided he had no choice but just to pull out of it. I wasn't that personally involved with it, and I just couldn't imagine destroying the footage. Uh, I figured that if I didn't do anything with it, somebody would someday. And uh, so I never really had a conversation about it ever since. He disappeared for 10 years uh, out of my life, so I was left with all this footage. And I didn't know what to do with it. And it basically sat in my basement for almost 10 years. But um, during that period of time, paid off all the debts over a period of about three uh, years or so and got out of debt and then 
but the film was still heavily weighted on me. Everyone kept asking, when am I going to finish the film? It's kind of ironic that when am I going to finish the film? I didn't know what the hell the film was supposed to be about. Uh, actually, most of us were, we felt that Valley was a special place. We were very possessive of it, as people can get, I guess, with things. It was kind of our climbing place. It's, it's hard to convey that now because so many, so many climbers are there and so many people go there, but there weren't that many tourists, actually. I mean, there were enough, but there weren't traffic jams or anything close to that. And very few climbers in the, in the early 60s, I can remember one summer when the only three climbers in Camp 4 were myself, Chuck Pratt, and Steve Roper. And then on the weekends, Royal and other people who had honest jobs would come up, but the rest of us were just climbing bums, three of us were climbing bums. And that was kind of the atmosphere in the valley at that time. It, it was our place, you know. And I guess Glenn felt that too, and, and he was worried about it ruining climbing. It's just kind of a laugh because, you know, it, it was getting so popular anyway. I don't think that, I'm, I'm sure that Clum, like you said, it, you found it inspiring in some way. I'm sure that's the case, but there's, there was a lot more to it than just that film. So I think that's one reason. He's adamant, he was so adamant. Um, you know, I, I went back to Colorado where I was building a cabin, so I wasn't hanging out in California, but um, I talked to Fred on the phone periodically, and he'd, he'd tell me things. And then later, actually many years later, in the early 2000s, I was invited to the Banff Film Festivals because they're going to show the film again, and invited me and Fred and uh, Lito, I guess, but Lito was by then in, in, down in Chile, so... He couldn't come, and but Glenn was there. He was shopping his new book, uh, Yosemite in the 60s. It's a beautiful book. I don't know if you've seen it, black and white photographs. And Fred and I went in the auditorium with everybody else and showed the film, and he didn't go in. He sat outside at the table where his books were. He's the only person out there. He was so adamant about not even being part of the film. I talked to him later that day or the next day in the cafeteria up there and I asked him why. And he refused to talk about it. I think he may have felt that he didn't do a very good job on filming it, partly because it's extremely difficult. I guess Fred's told you what, you know, using this 12 or 13 pound Aeroflex camera with a 100 foot roll, that in the first 10 feet would get flashed every time he changed the roll when we were up on the cliff, even though it was in a changing bag. And, so it was extremely difficult climbing, and the, and the climb and the shooting was mostly up and down. You know, as I said, it's hard to get off to the side. And I think he felt it was hard hard to do a good enough job, and that, that the film wasn't doing a, you know, doing justice to the climb. And then when he got the footage, he he discovered that well we all knew there was no summit to El Capitan. I mean, there's no summit footage. I mean, he took us climbing up through the you know off the granite onto into the Manzanita bushes, but it's a very undramatic exit to a dramatic climb. You just you you your last bit was direct aid for us, and you step onto a friction slope, which gradually gets easier, and then you just walk off into the gravel and the bushes. So the real was, I think he was kind of discouraged. He didn't think he really had a film. And he ended up giving it to Fred. And then I think later he decided he would like it destroyed after he'd given it to Fred. But by then it was too late, of course, because Fred have it, had it and, uh, and felt invested in it, not only monetarily, because Fred was deeply in debt because of people pulling out the money on the film partly and because there just wasn't enough money to begin with. I think the time that uh, between the filming and the actual process of putting together, there was, you know, there was eight, at least eight years there where I was not dealing with the film at all, but somehow I was incubating in my mind, or maybe it was just erased from my, I'm not sure which, but when I actually went back to it, uh, eight or nine years later, it was like, a, okay, I've got this stuff. It's a big giant puzzle. What am I going to do with it? 
And uh, I was no longer emotionally involved with the climb. I wasn't emotionally involved with Glenn or with anybody else. I was just here. This giant puzzle uh, is sitting before me and I got to put it together. What can I make of it? And I think <clears throat> I couldn't have done that immediately after filming. I just, I would have been too involved with what Glenn might've done. I would have been exhausted from the whole filming process. And I just couldn't have done it. But that period of, uh, those years in between the completion of the filming and the starting of the editing uh, was uh, made it possible for me just to take on the project fresh and uninhibited. I didn't feel like I owed any allegiance to anybody. I just did what I needed to do to make a, the best film I could make. No concern about climbers. I wasn't making the film for climbers. Uh, I was making the film for myself and a few of my friends who I would show it to as I was working I was free of the climbing process. I was free of the experience. I was free of all the debts. I was free of all that because it had happened, you know, that was all gone. I was free enough to just do what I, just to take on the challenge and do the best I could in terms of making a film. And, and it came out the way you see it. He's like that. He's, uh, I mean, he's really, uh, really good at what he does. I mean, for him to make a film of that was, Borderline miracle, in in my opinion. He's not a climber, to begin with, but he could appreciate from a distance. He's a good observer. So he's that kind of person. He really gets involved in something. And I think being an advisor to the film, he was deeply involved in it the whole time. And, you know, he was, for, as you know, he was uh, Glenn's advisor and teacher at, uh, at San Francisco State, where Glenn then took his uh, film making course. But anyway, it sat there for eight or 10 years. And finally, I pulled it all out. Lito Teatro Flores came and stayed with me. And he helped me lay the film out so it's accurate from the bottom to the top. So every pitch is accurately laid out um, and made sure that everything that we put together was, uh, was in fact chronologically correct. Um, and then Richard McCracken, the third climber, he came and actually moved in with me because he was, uh, I guess he was in between moves or something. But anyway, he wanted to be in Marin County for a while. So he and I became very good friends. And um, he went through and out of the 100 hours or so of sound, of which most was static, um, he, uh, he pulled out about 20 minutes, where he, which he thought was interesting material. And uh, we kind of did it together, but I sort of dumped on him to really go through it. So he sat there very patiently over a period of about two or three weeks and listened to all the tapes and ended up with about 20 or 30 minutes of actual sound that was usable. That was huge. I mean, as you know, we, we all wore microphones hooked to a transmitter, which went to receivers down in the shack at the base of the climb. So... All three climbers had that, and then Glenn also had one. Um, so we had hours and hours of tape, quarter-inch tape. You know, most of which is a lot of mumbling and groaning and swearing and <laughs> et cetera. So, yeah, I, I uh, actually lived with, uh, he had a little cottage in the backyard where he lived in Mill Valley. Northern California, and um, I had split up. I didn't know it at the time, but I split up with my wife, so I kind of ended up staying there quite a while, a year and a half, a little more than that. And so I didn't have a lot to do. I, I, I'm a carpenter. I was a carpenter at that time, so I got a job working a couple days a week in, in San Francisco, and the rest of the time, I was just free to ride my motorcycle or do whatever I wanted. So I spent a lot of that time down in the basement going through this quarter-inch tapes and editing out all what I considered to be the useful sounds. Much of it wasn't useful. Uh, you know, there was, um, you know, just people mumbling or not saying anything. Uh, I did pull out the sounds of pitons being pounded and, and the wind blowing and, this, and the chittering of the... Uh, white-throated swifts that were um, nesting in the in the cracks in the rock around us, and got enough, uh, you know, 
plenty of hours of useful stuff so Fred could boil it all down to the, you know, pull it all out to use in the film. Um, yeah. An ugly job, but somebody had to do it. So then I had the film made up pretty well, but it, as you know, climbing is a pretty slow process. So I edited the first part of the film. Glenn had shot some very beautiful scenery in, in, um, in Yosemite. And I laid that out and laid it out in such a way that it was very slow. It just kind of took you into the image. You literally didn't know what you were going to, what the film was all about. And you, you, but it really slowed the pace down as slow as I could get it to go. And then after about five minutes, I brought into the, the, the credits and then we actually started the climb. And when they get to the top, <clears throat> there's never any real footage at the top. You know, usually a classic thing was that they get to the top and they open up a bottle of champagne. I thought that was pretty corny. And, uh, but I was concerned about what we were going to do um, uh, at the end of the film because Glenn didn't have us, uh, had no idea how we might do it. And um, so I had talked to, I, I could communicate with the climbers over a, um, a walkie talkie. So one of the climbers had a walkie talkie as well as his um, wireless mics. And I could listen to everything they were saying because I was next to the speaker on the tape, on the tape recorder. So that the communication between myself and Glenn and the climbers was pretty, pretty clear all during the entire filming. And I had told Dick, I said, Dick, why don't you just have a dream about carrying a watermelon up the, up the side of the mountain? I hadn't really thought out how we might use that, but Glick, uh, Dick or Richard McCracken, had uh we hit it off quite well immediately he has a great sense of humor and so ever so often he would be talking about this watermelon toledo and uh so I, it gave me sound that i could use in terms of conversation which allowed me to work on this sound montage towards the end <clears throat> we brought us a mountain we did bring a watermelon up to the top of the, of the mountain so when the climbers came over the top we had this watermelon and nobody expected that. Glenn didn't even know there was no watermelon involved. I had another guy just haul it up. And, um, or actually we drove around and hiked in with it. Um, and then when they came to the top, there was a watermelon and they were hot and thirsty and I didn't have to say anything. I just filmed them as they cut the watermelon open. That gave me great material to end the film on because it was kind of celebratory. They were, they were, they were just. Clouded. The whole filming process was over. I had a dream very similar to Lingo at one point, where I was prisoning with this load, a load of that gigantic watermelon hanging from my waist. Mm-hmm. And it was all tied in with all these slings that wrapped around. And then there was somebody who was driving a pizza and I woke up. It sort of incubated over seven or eight or ten years. Like. Once I really got into it, the whole film came together fairly quickly. Lido Tiago Flores had laid it out for me. It's the way that the the uh, climb correctly chronologically went, and all I, all I needed to do was cut that three hours or so down to whatever seemed to make sense. So I was there with about th- three hours of film was chronologically correct, and about a half an hour's worth of sound, which was just random sound. And I fooled around with that for a few months and um, cut the film down to about an hour, and then I started playing with the sound. And I, I have a background in music, so I always sort of sort of approach the whole sound as a, a musical composition, and um, started cutting up sound and laying it on with the, the laying the sound on the image in a contrapuntal way. Uh, as an example, if uh, it appeared the climbers were in a stressful situation, I would find sound that was contradictory to that. They would be joking or doing something like that. So that. I, I kept this contrapuntal relationship between the sound and the picture all the way through. The other, the other thing that people always ask about is the moon sequence. And that was something that I, uh, I came up with when the film was almost edited. I just felt like something has to break the film. Up. It turns out that the night sequence fit quite well at halfway through the film. Um, but that sequence, um, we had all the sound of them climbing at night. And we have the sound of Glenn, of uh, Gary Culliver falling and breaking a couple of ribs. So that night sequence was um, created from reality, but not the way it really happened. 
I wanted to lean into that because it was such a, you know, such a terrifying period. I had some footage of the moon that I'd shot at another time. I had built an eight inch telescope when I was in high school and I, uh, it was, uh, eight inches in diameter, not with focal length. So it was a pretty big telescope. And I devised a, 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 hooked my camera to it. And when we had a full moon one night, not in Yosemite, I filmed this in Marin County. I filmed the moon just passing by the cross the camera scene. And, and then I superimposed a silhouette that we had filmed at some point during the filming. And I made the high contrast and superimposed the silhouette of the climber and his rope across the moon, allowed me to do that moon sequence, which I felt was a good resolution out of the night sequence, which was in a way kind of terrifying, at least to non-climbers, it's terrifying. And um, so that gave me a great break to change the mood and everything in the middle of the film. I, I, I knew at the time Gary Snyder, the poet. So when the film was essentially done, I showed it to him and I said I was kind of not quite sure where to where it was, whether it was what else I had to do with it to make it, to finish it. And he looked at it and he says, eh, Fred, it's done. Don't touch it. Just leave it as it is. And that gave me the confidence to say, okay, I guess, I guess I'll just get a print made. And that's kind of how it finishes by him saying, yeah, it's good enough. Leave it alone. It's done. And it's kind of way a painter sometimes paints. You know, he, he's painting a picture and at some point he decides, I guess it must be done. I'm going to go on to my next picture. Uh, my next painting and uh, it, again it's all kind of s unconscious uh, and subliminal I had been scheduled to show it at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art as a premiere and I still didn't have a print and I was having it printed in Los Angeles I lived in San Francisco at that time and Los Angeles was um, 300 miles south of here but that was the lab that uh, I ha was having the print made and they had made a couple of prints, and they were unacceptable. There were just a lot of mistakes in uh, off color and off density. And but finally, I got a print that was uh, usable, and they printed it that morning. And I had to get onto an airplane with the print and fly back to San Francisco and be ready to show it that evening. And uh, I, uh, it was in the afternoon. They finally got the the print off the processing machine, and I ran to the airport, got in a plane, the plane encountered a big storm uh, between San Francisco and uh, and L.A. And there was some question whether we were even going to make it to San Francisco with that. There was some talk about actually landing <laughs> before we got there. But we made it to San Francisco, and I grabbed a cab and made it to the museum, and the audience was already coming in to see the film. Uh, and um, and I just showed, I, I showed up, I was on the elevator with all these people. And I thought, geez, a lot of people coming to this museum at this late at night. And it turns out they were all coming to see the film. And, um, so we showed the film and it was, uh, it went over quite well and it was pretty well publicized because we, there was a whole audience outside waiting to get in. So we actually showed it twice that night. And, uh, I, it was, it was really kind of a surprise because I didn't know what to expect. Um, and, uh, but it was, it was well received. And so it really was, it turned out to be a labor of love. But anyway, he pulled that all together and it was really a triumph for him. I'm sure he saw it as a triumph. I'm sure he was glad it was over at the same time. And then he started, you know, started going to the film festivals, started getting all these kudos because it really was a, more of an art film than a climbing film. So it was a great combination. Of a climbing, of climbing and art, and um, Glenn surprisingly showed up, as well as did Douglas Hopkins. I never expected to see them again. When I finished the film, I did make an attempt to reach him and finally located where he was living, which turned out he was in San Francisco. I didn't know he was in San Francisco all this time, and I called him up on the phone and I said, "Hey, Glenn, I just finished the film, and we're going to show it at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art." And he said, "Oh." That was about all he said, and then that was the end of the conversation. And his wife said something to my wife, which was very strange. He said to his wife, that's a phone call I've been waiting for for 10 years. And his wife had no idea what he was talking about. He'd never mentioned the film project to her. She had no idea. But anyway, he showed up, very friendly. He had instructed me beforehand when we split up in 
uh, you know, when we split up in 1970, that he didn't, he didn't want the film made. He had, he did not want his credits on the film. He did not want his name connected to the film if it were any fin- if ever finished. So when it came time to do the credits, I thought, well, he doesn't want credit for the film. He doesn't want his name affiliated with the film. I'm going to give him credit as a climber who filmed. And, and it just, I felt that was really what it was. I mean, he was a magnificent cinematographer, but he also was the climber that made it possible. And so when we went up and talked after the film, I said to Glenn, Glenn, I, I know you didn't want your name on the film, affiliated with the film, and that I was not to give you credit for your work. But I, I did, as you can see, and I did it in a subtle sort of way. I said, but I can remove it. I can still go back to the uh, negative and I can remove your name. He thought they're stroking his beard for a long while. And he says, well, you can leave my name on the film. And uh, that I took as a compliment. There are so many ways that this film might never have been made. And different reasons to want to walk away from it. Doug with business reasons. Glenn worried about the effects it might have in the world. Fred, who might tinker forever. The most interesting feature for me was that Richard sits in this zone between the business and the art. And he'd walked away from climbing already. And it was no big deal for him. You know, I I had pretty much stopped climbing when we made the film. I had done some big wall first ascents in various places around North America. About... Um, 1965, I had, had moved to Aspen, Colorado and, and bought a mining claim outside of town at, at 10,000 feet up in the mountains. So, And I wasn't doing any climbing at all when I got a call from Glenn saying, you want to you wanna come be in this climbing film with the nose? So I went back to the valley, my wife and I, and we, we, I got back into shape and we did the film. And then I went back to Colorado and... and uh, I did a couple of climbs with a young friend there. I actually gave him all my climbing gear. Well, I kept a few pitons and a few carabiners for you no know, keepsakes, but in my mind, I had really given up climbing. I mean, I started because I my answer I tell people was because well, in the end, because I just had to. You know, something had attracted me so much I I couldn't help myself. As far as stopping goes, I think I. I think I'd done enough. I, it was like an exploration. I climbed for 15 years, you know, seen a bit of the world. You know, once in a while I look back on it and I kind of missed it, but I didn't feel attracted to go back to it. Climbers I climb with, like Royal, for instance, Royal Robbins, he, he climbed until he had arthritis and couldn't really do it anymore. To me, climbing wasn't necessarily about getting to the top. And I'd climb things part way and then come down. I didn't feel like going all the way sometimes. Smaller climbs, of course. When you start out on a big time, you, you bloody well want to get to the top. I think it was the experience of being on the rock. It was, to me, like a kind of a spiritual experience. There's something special about sitting, especially on the big wall, sitting, sitting you know, one or 2,000 feet off the ground on a ledge looking down, watching the world, or looking out across, you know, miles and miles of mountains. You climb in Canada, you do that. And, you know, I climb Mount Robson, huge mountain in Canada, and and the Bugaboos. And when you're on those mountains, you can see thousands of other mountains if you keep looking around. There's something about being in that situation was very special to me that I'm not sure every, not necessarily everybody felt that way. It was more like a sport to them, I guess, which it is to me too, to some extent. I mean, I'm not a religious person, really. I'm an agnostic when it comes to my Christianity. Although I think there there are gods. I think they live in they live in the world. They are the world in a way. And I could experience that up on the rocks in places where I never experienced that anywhere else. You know, and to me, that was the the biggest attraction, and being with the people. Being with climbing with the people, it's a very special people when you climb with them. You know, anybody that you climb that climbs is a special person, I think. At least the ones I've climbed with have been. And uh, there's something 
unique about them and willing to to put the risk out there to to learn what they have to learn from being you know committing yourself to something that you're afraid to commit yourself to that kind of stuff and to me that that was the import that's what I got out of it and I think that's one of the reasons I could walk away from it is I got what I was going to get out of it I was ready to go on to some other kind of experience When I was 18, I went to Yosemite, and I wasn't good enough to consider climbing a big wall. And anyway, it was January and there was 18 inches of snow on the floor. But we bivvied out in the trees at Camp 4, and the following morning walked up to the base of El Capitan and gazed upwards. A few years earlier, a friend had loaned me a VHS of an old climbing film. And as we stood at the base of the wall, I imagined the figure, the Swami belt around his waist, swinging back and forth and back and forth. As we stood there, huge chunks of ice started falling from the summit and landing ten metres out from the wall. We pressed our backs against the rock and waited. Once there was a gap, we ran for it, laughing in the snow all the way back to Camp 4. And there we found two climbers, some kid from New York called Levi. He was a little spaced out, He'd got himself committed on a roped solo of Washington Column and he'd been caught out in a snowstorm. His gear was trapped up there. He was going to have to call work to say he'd be late. How late, I said. A couple of weeks, I guess, he replied. That's quite late, I thought. The other climber was easily found by following the scent and on a bench under the midnight lightning boulder we found Chongo Chuck, theoretical physicist and legendary climber. We spent the evening huddling around the bench under the boulder, with a few beers and Chongo's hash pipe. And Chongo started talking physics. We were all a little the worse for wear by this point. And Levi piped up, confused. So, if a tree falls in the woods, he started, and there's no one around? Did it really fall? What if it hit another tree? He glanced around at the giant redwoods towering over us. It's a weird thought. Those little things having such a cascading impact. It could set off an avalanche, said Chongo, lighting the remnants of his pipe and inhaling deeply. He held his breath before puffing out a long plume of smoke into the still night air. I watched the smoke dissipate past the lightning bolt on the rock. Maybe Glenn was right. And what about Fred? 30 years after releasing the original film, he remastered it so that he could release a DVD version. So, and then I can see him not wanting to have anything to do with it for a while and then, um, you know, not being able to let it go. Because, you know, he knows we're good friends, he and I. I guess he just needed to keep going with it a little more. He went frame by frame through it, removing all the blemishes the dirt spots and so on. Incredible what he did. Oh, that, that was, it was kind of a, a period of madness in my life. And I went frame by frame, over 80,000 frames. Practically lost my eyesight and went insane doing it. Thanks to Fred and Richard for their time putting this together. I did contact Leto as well, but he wasn't available for an interview, unfortunately. Doug Tompkins died in 2015. He left a significant amount of land to the Chilean and Argentinian governments as a national park. I also got in touch with Glenn Denny, but perhaps unsurprisingly, he never got back to me. You've been listening to Factor 2 from UK Climbing. I'm Will Treasure. Thanks for listening. I had a dream very similar to Lito at one point. Well, it was crazy. It was load, a load of that gigantic watermelon hanging from my waist. <laughs> and it was all tied in, and all these swings are wrapped around. And then there was somebody who was driving a seat on it, and I woke up. And <laughs> I couldn't move, and the swing kept slipping. Today, I think it would be a hard day on water. One has that feeling, all right. <laughs>